Good morning, and welcome to the first Unitarian Fellowship. Oh, of shit. Our mission is to create spiritual connection and bring compassion, discovery, and social justice to life. My name is Larry Bolt, and I am privileged to serve as your service leader today. My pronouns are he and him. Now we ask you to please take a moment to turn your cell phones to a spiritual mode. Now, we have a whole bunch of people on Zoom today, so we want to say hello to them. So we'll ask you to turn around, and up at the back wall up top there is a green frog. Wave to the green frog. That's where the camera is. And they can all see us then. And then you turn around and you can see them on the screen here waving to us. <laughs> Whatever your ethnicity, race, theological belief, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, age, and everything else that makes you who you are, please know that you are warmly welcome in our community. We are grateful for a diversity of voices on Sunday morning, and our services vary from week to week. If you're joining us online, please consider sharing your contact information with us. You can share it with the host by going to the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. We'd love to welcome you to our community. We have a wonderful website, ufon.ca. That's ufon.ca. And we invite you to check it out for more detailed information about who we are, the services we offer, and how you can connect with us. We acknowledge today that we meet on the traditional, oh, waving, are we still? Okay. <laughs> we acknowledge today that we meet on the traditional territory of the Sunamah First Nation. As Unitarians, we are committed to the work of reconciliation required to address the harm done to all Indigenous people by our, by, by, and their cultures by non-Indigenous peoples. We have much to learn from the Indigenous perspective that the earth is the source of all life and that our responsibility is to honor and care for it. We'd like to thank Diane Cleary today for these beautiful daffodils that she brought in this morning. If you want to find out about special events, groups, and meetings taking place in the fellowship, either go to the calendar on that website I told you about or read the weekly update email that is sent out on Fridays. So now let us enter into sacred time. Leah Hokinson, our musical director, will lead us into worship through music.
good morning. It is so good to be here with you. I am Reverend Deborah Falk. For those who don't know me, I use she, her pronouns. And I know today we have more people than usual on um, Zoom with us since there's been a little bit of a flow of COVID once again through our community. So in addition to the welcome of them, we also send healing energy that it be passed through with ease. I offer these words to bring us together this morning, a bright thread of hope written by, by my dear colleague, uh, the Reverend Gretchen Haley. There is too much beauty in this world to give up on it yet. And it is always too soon to surrender to cynicism. Bring your doubt, your skepticism, your downright confusion, even your bitterness. But in the midst of all of these, in the center, wrap your tender fingers around that still, bright thread of hope. Feel it in your heart, that still, steady hunger for something more. The vision we glimpse every day in the rising sun. Across the waters, the light spreads across the faces of the ones we love. The look of knowing all there is to know and still loving life. Loving us just as we are. For this hour, we come to celebrate, to praise, to give thanks, to refuse to give up, to steady ourselves, us keepers of hope, brave builders of this still possible world. Come, let us worship together. The Ember of Hope and Love Set Ablaze by Reverend Lisa Dove. What if? Sometimes it's not about a light in the darkness. What if? Sometimes it's about sparking potential into possibility and possibility into existence. What if? Sometimes the flame that burns in the chalice of our faith is nothing less than the Ember of Hope and nothing more than love set ablaze. What if sometimes all we need to do is follow this flame, one among scores, hundreds, thousands of steadily flickering flames across the land and among so many peoples on the way to justice and into the land of peace? What if we dare to kindle that chalice? Please rise in body or in spirit and we'll sing together, Now Let Us Sing. And if you want to sing the lower part, feel free to do that. And if you want to sing the higher part, feel free to do that. <laughs>
morning. Good morning. My name is Wendy Ellen. I'm the Director of Spiritual Exploration for Children and Youth, and my prona pronouns are she and her. And today's story that I will be reading is called I Hope by Monique Gray Smith and illustrated by Gabrielle Grimard. I hope. I hope that you and those you love know joy. I hope that you are kind. I hope you have belly laughs. I hope you love to learn. I hope that when you, I hope that when sad tears leave your eyes, someone is there to catch them. I hope you are helpful. I hope you know beautiful happiness. I hope you play outside. I hope you are a caretaker of Mother Earth. I hope that when you need a hug, there are loving arms to hold you. I hope that you and those you love have healthy food, clean water, and a safe place to sleep. I hope you are courageous. Every child matters. We are one, equal. Every child matters. I hope you remember to smile, that beautiful smile of yours. I hope you are respectful. I hope you always remember that you are special and you matter. I have lots of hopes for you and for me but I wonder, what are your hopes? Thank you. Such a beautiful story. Now that people are attending services both in the hall and online, we have updated how we accept donations and pledges to support the fellowship. If you're new in the hall, we will now pass the baskets for the collection. If this is your first time with us, your presence is your contribution. Those online can go to our website and click on the big blue donate button at the bottom of the home page and follow the instructions to donate via e-transfer or check. To help the wider community, 50% of all anonymous donations received are donated to the designated charity of the month. Our charity for this month is the Coastal Research Society. The Coastal Research Society works to advance marine conservation through science and education. They engage in research, mapping, and analysis, promote ecosystem-based management, and the value of intact ocean ecosystems. They are also the major funder of Living Oceans Clear the Coast program, which includes cleaning the beaches, 
and coastline of Vancouver Island. To, to learn more, check out their website, coastalresearch.ca. Now, if you're donating online or check, these are not anonymous. So if you wish to contribute to the charity of the month, you need to note that on e-transfer or check. We are grateful for your offering. Let us take a moment of centering, a moment to go inward, to be with each other in community and yet fully with ourselves, to become totally present. I will offer some words, there will be a silence, and Leah will bring us out with music. I take us to our centering time with the words we hold hope close. In this community, we hold hope close. We don't always know what comes next, but that cannot dissuade us. We don't always know just what to do, but that will not mean that we are lost in the wilderness. We rely on the certainty beneath, the foundation of our values and ethics. We are the people who turn and return to love like a North Star and to the truth that we are greater together than we are alone. Our hope does not live in some glimmer of an indistinct future, rather, we know the way to the world of which we dream, and by covenant and the movement forward of one right action and then the next, we know that one day we will arrive at home. Today's reading is uh, called Hope, Not Optimism by Bruce Marshall. Optimism, as I understand it, is an attitude of expectation that a particular result will occur, that we will achieve a specific goal, that the publisher's clearinghouse will pick my number from among the billions submitted. Hope is less specific. It's an attitude that looks for possibility in whatever life deals us. 
Hope does not anticipate a particular outcome, but keeps before us the possibility that something useful will come from this. We are told that an optimistic outlook is a good thing, but optimism often leads to disappointment. When the best possible outcome doesn't occur, we are let down, but hope encourages us to move forward despite the setbacks. Optimism may lead us to expectations that are unrealistic and ultimately hurtful. Hope advises us to look squarely at the realities that confront us while remaining aware of the possibilities. Eric Fromm observed, to hope means to be ready at every moment for that which is not yet born and yet not become desperate if there is no birth in our lifetime. Those whose hope is weak settle for comfort or for violence. Those whose hope is strong see and cherish signs of new life and are ready every moment to help with the birth of that which is ready to be born. Please rise again as the Spirit moves you and we will sing together as we sing of hope and joy. <laughs> So appreciate the stand for us vertically challenged folks. Uh, I trust and hope we all have had moments in our life when there is a sense of incredible gratitude and good fortune for finding oneself in a particular situation. One of those significant moments happened in my life in February of 2015, when I had the amazing good fortune of being one of 25 ministers chosen to spend four days with Joanna Macy. Is that a name familiar to folks? Uh, I am so humbled by that experience for so many reasons. As I have prepared for this morning, I have deepened that appreciation Back in the 1980s, when I had finally begun my academic studies for ministry, a calling that I'd had since the 1960s, I co-facilitated workshops and retreats that we termed sacred ecology. Much of the content came from the early work of Joanna Macy. Perhaps some of you might remember the book, one of her early books, 
despair and personal power in the nuclear age. Or thinking like a mountain toward a council of all beings. This is a book she co-authored with Arne Ness, the Norwegian philosopher who coined the term deep ecology, the term and perspective that inspired our term of sacred ecology for the workshops. Sacred ecology, I think, is a clear articulation of our seventh principle, our respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. For deep ecology doesn't stay on the surface of the web, it goes into the multifaceted levels of it. One of the reasons I have found Joanna Macy's work so meaningful is that there is not a denial of the anguish that we all carry, of the devastation that we witness, of the global crisis we are facing, or the personal challenges we each have. One of the foundational aspects of her work, work that she calls now the work that reconnects, is the recognition of how much energy it takes to repress these feelings. When they are acknowledged and collectively held, the energy that is released can be redirected to working for the common good, for the changes that are needed. This is a very hopeful perspective, a perspective on life, and it requires a willingness to acknowledge, hold, and release the pain, not to deny or repress it. Hope advises us to look squarely at the realities that confront us while remaining aware of the possibilities. Hope, I have suggested, is a spiritual practice of sorts. It is an intention and an orientation to life. It is also demanding and sometimes elusive. It is personal and collective. For, as the great Sufi mystic Rumi says, there is a secret medicine given only to those who Hurt, who hurt so hard they cannot hope. It is this. Look as long as you can at the friend that you love. This is the medicine to bring us back to hope. During that four-day experience with Joanna Macy, there was an exercise of sitting across from one another, or from one other participant, one person being the ancestor, and the other held the role of the great, great, great grandchild, a hundred years in the future, asking their ancestor what they did during this time, our time, the time that Joanna Macy calls the great turning. What did you do, our, and our, our prodigy asked, to contribute to the shift that was so desperately needed in the face of the current, our current global situation. Now in this exercise, I held the role of ancestor. Sitting in front of me was Joanna Macy herself. She was 86 at the time. How would you answer that question? What have you done? What did you do during the time of the great turning? I was invited to look into the eyes of my prodigy, Joanna Macy. And this made that quote from Rumi even more poignant. I do wholeheartedly believe that hope is a motivator and that it can be cultivated. Hope is not maudlin or elusive. It is a consequence of eyes and hearts being wide open. Our meditation said that we hold hope close. Hope 
is a foundation of our ethics and our faith. Theologian Jürgen Moltmann says, and I quote from him, faith, whenever it develops into hope, causes not rest, but unrest, not patience, but impatience. It does not calm the unquieted heart, but is itself the unquieted heart. In all of us, those who hope can no longer put up with reality as it is, but begin to suffer under it and to contradict it. True hope means conflict with the world for the goal of the promised future stabs inexorably into the flesh of every unfulfilled presence. That's pretty, pretty big concept, this moving faith to hope. This faith developed into hope is so desperately needed. It is a collective call to action and empowerment of the spiritual communities to address big issues we all share as one species on this planet. Reinforcing this intention, I recall attending the Parliament of the World's Religions in Toronto in 2018 and hearing again the words from environmental scientist Gus Septh. And I'd heard the quote before, but somehow in the space of the parliament with all of the different folks coming together with the intention of hope and healing, he said, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science would address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. For it is here in such communities as this that we begin to create such a transformation. One of Joanna Macy's more current books is titled Active Hope, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy. I highly recommend it. She says, of all of the dangers we face from climate chaos to nuclear war, none is so great as deadening of our response. Apathy can take away all hope. I appreciated one of the quotes that was in our touchstones um, materials for this month, this month with our, our theme of hope. It credits Augustine of Hippo as writing this, but when I did a deeper dive into that, there's all kinds of controversy about whether and where the quote actually comes from, which doesn't make it any res less relevant, just important to look at where things come from. So, attributed in our documents to Augustine of Hippo, hope has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage. Anger at the way things are, and courage to see that they don't remain the same as they are. We cannot be complacent in these times. A spiritual community such as us, such as this holds us, inspires us, and gives us hope, collective hope, to act on our values and ethics. I continue to be touched by how this community lives that out in all that you do. It was interesting to discover the depth of work and study being done with the power of hope in the secular world as well. An area that has, for me, has intrigued me and asks for more expl exploration. 
that's one of my challenges is that I do so much research that I end up going down a bunch of rabbit holes. <laughs> and one of them for me was some research spearheaded by Anthony Sicoli, a professor of psychology and an author of the book Power of Hope. It demonstrates that hope is a skill that can be acquired. He has 14 dimensions to it. I didn't get into those. But he suggests that hope is very active. You can cultivate it and nourish it. It is multifaceted and self-perpetuating. He said hopeful people tend to be more resilient, more trusting, more open, and more motivated than those less hopeful. So they are likely to receive more from the world, which in turn makes them more hopeful. It's self-perpetuating. And that's why it's important. Hope, Sicoli theorizes, has a strong spiritual and transpersonal dimension. It is associated with virtues such as patience, gratitude, charity, and faith. Faith, he says, is the building block of hope. Above all, it is based on relationship, on a collaborative connection with people, as well as a higher power, a distinct, as distinct from optimism, which is connected to self-confidence, much like the reading Larry offered earlier, that distinction between optimism and hope. Hope also di differs from denial of reality, which is really a false hope, an avoidance of truth that narrows one, one's field of focus. So how might we cultivate hope? Being a part of a community such as this is certainly a part of it. And there are, I must say, numerous websites that offer possibilities. One I found that intrigued me had some very concrete suggestions to offer. It put forward the idea that hope is a positive and potent spiritual practice with the power to pull us through difficult times. It's often described using light as a metaphor. Hope as a ray of hope, a beam or a glimmer of hope, the break in the clouds, the light at the end of a dark tunnel. And it's often found in unexpected places. So hope can be learned with practice, and certain attitudes support it for sure. One of those is patience, an ability to tolerate delays, a willingness to let events unfold in their own time. Another is courage, one of Hippo's daughters, an attitude of confidence when we are facing the unknown. And a third is persistence, the determination to keep going no matter what happens. We have hope when we can say all will be well and we mean it. I would add another virtue to this, and that is forgiveness. I do believe that in the act of forgiveness, hope emerges. There's also another, uh, perhaps more telling expression that hope for the best but expect the worst. I'm not sure that that's hope, that's more optimism. The more likely outcome it impl implies is gonna be the worst. When we are without hope, we easily fall victim to such negative attitudes. The light of hope, if absent, we can, can be overcome by, with the absence of hope, we can be overcome by gloom and doom and despair. Despair is at the other end of the continuum of hope. Pay attention and allow hope to be an active force in our lives. Joanna Macy, in her book, Active Hope, says, active hope is waking up to the beauty of life on whose behalf we can act. We belong to this world. 
So a couple of practical applications for this enhancing or cultivating of hope that really intrigued me. One was when we turn on the light to think about it as adding hope to the world. When we plant a seed or a bulb as we're all here on the West Coast getting ready to do, remember to plant hope as well. I'd like to close my reflection with a beautiful poem from Ruman Olives, who says, what is hope? It is a presentiment that imagination is more real and reality less real than it looks. It is a hunch that the overwhelming brutality of facts that oppress and repress is not the last word. It is a suspicion that reality is more complex than realism wants us to believe and that the frontiers of the possible are not determined by the limits of the actual. And that in a miraculous and unexpected way, life is preparing the creative events which will open the way to freedom and resurrection. The two, suffering and hope, live from each other. Suffering without hope produces resentment and despair. Hope without suffering creates illusion, naivete, and drunkenness. Let us plant dates even though those who plant them will never eat them. We must live by the love of what we will never see. This is the secret discipline. It is a refusal to let the creative act be dissolved in immediate sense experience and a stubborn commitment to the future of our grandchildren. Such disciplined love is what has given prophets, revolutionaries, and saints the courage to die for the future they envisage. They make their own bodies the seed of their highest hope. May we continue to cultivate hope within ourselves and within this community. May we be guided by the care the nurture and the connections we have with each other. May we let love guide us, and may we sing it with song number 131.
We are nearing the end of our service. After we sing Carry the Flame, we invite you to join a social group. There are breakout rooms available online for the next 30 minutes. If you want to join a breakout room, stay online and the host will put you in one. For those here in the hall, we invite you to join us for coffee, tea, snacks and conversation. I just want to talk about gratitude a bit. You know, I am so grateful today. You know, we've had this beautiful service that's happening, but there's so many behind the scenes. The people who come in and get the coffee on early, <clears throat> the kettle boiling. We've got beautiful music from Leah. The audiovisual team, just superb. I'm so grateful to have them here. <clears throat> and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to be up here today and to be able to work with Reverend Deborah. <clears throat> Excuse me. It just I'm, fills my heart with gratitude to be with all these wonderful people here today. Our closing words are Affirmation of Hope by Loretta Williams. We, bearers of the dream, affirm that a new vision of hope is emerging. We pledge to work for, for that community in which justice will be actively present. We affirm that there is a struggle yet ahead, yet we know that in that struggle is the hope for the future. We affirm that we are co-creators of the future, not passive pawns. And we stand united in affirmation of our hope and vision of a just and inclusive society. We affirm the unity of all persons. We affirm brotherhood and sisterhood that allows us to touch each other's humanity. We affirm a unity that opens our eyes, ears, and hearts to see the different but common forms of oppression, suffering, and pain. Yet we are one in the image of God, and we celebrate our hopes for human unity. Within ourselves, within the gathered community, we will discover the strength not to hide in indifference. Affirming that hope, publicly expressed, energizes and enables us to move forward. Together we pledge action to transcend barriers, be they racial, political, economic, social, or religious. We pledge to make our tomorrows become our todays. We extinguish, we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. We'll now sing our final song, Carry the Flame. The words are on the wall at the back here in the hall and in the corner here. Our customer is to stand, hold hands, or touch elbows as you are comfortable. We generally make a big circle if we can.